Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is Left Think Books welcomes author, scholar, psychoanalyst, well, sorry, scholar, psychoanalyst, and critically acclaimed author, Makita Brotman, who will discuss her new true crime book, Couple Found Slain After a Family Murder. Brotman tonight will be in conversation with author Baynard Woods. Left Think Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, these supporters are Makita and Baynard, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. We offer curbside pickup and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world even. We are now open to customers coming into the store again, finally. So you can find this incredible book on our front table. We are happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoyed this event and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a copy for you or for your friends at left-bank.com. Purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating and it allows us to keep this event series going. So thank you for your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event. So please type your questions as a comment. You can do that at any point in time as you think of the question. And be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook and YouTube to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. We have a ton of events lined up for July, and I am adding really incredible events to August. So be sure to keep an eye on and now about tonight's book, Couple Found Slain After a Family Murder. Critically acclaimed author and psychoanalyst Makita Brotman offers, a, offers literary true crime writing at its best, taking us into the life of a murderer after his conviction, when most stories end, but the defendant's life goes on. On February 21st, 1992, 20-year-old Brian Bechtold walked into a police station in Port St. Joe, Florida, and confessed that he'd shot and killed his parents in their family home in Silver Spring, Maryland. He said he'd been possessed by the devil. He was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia and ruled not criminally responsible for the murders on grounds of insanity. But after the trial, where do the criminally insane go? Brotman reveals Brian's inner life leading up to the murder, as well as his complicated afterlife in a maximum security psych psychiatric hospital where he is neither imprisoned nor free. During his 27 years at the hospital, Brian has tried to escape and been shot by police and has witnessed three patient-on-patient -patient murders. He's experienced the drugging of patients beyond recognition, a sadistic system of rewards and punishment, and the short-lived reign of a crazed psychiatrist turned stalker. In the tradition of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which I am wearing my fantastic shirt, Couple Found Slain is an insider's account of life in the underworld of, of forensic psych wards in America and the forgotten lives of those held there, often indefinitely. <clears throat> this is the New York Times 2021 summer reading pick. Deborah Rudisil, the author of Riddle of Gender, Science, Activism, and Transgender Rights, says, Makita Brotman's Couple Found Slain is a riveting account of a terrible crime and its aftermath. Deeply researched and compulsively readable, Brotman exposes the myriad ways that forensic psychology and a calcified system failed Bechtold and others judged not criminally responsible for their actions. A gripping investigation that, that questions not only the sentence without end meted out to Bechtold, but the psychiatric dogma used to justify his continued incarceration. And James Renner, the author of True Crime Addict, says, Brotman has established herself as a leading voice in modern true crime. She finds empathy in the criminal and shows compassion for those whom society wishes to simply forget. This is not just a well-written book. It's an important book, a must read. And I say that as a lover of true crime, the books, not obviously the actual true crime, that this is just a creative and really untold story. So it's something that you will definitely be interested in if you have any interest in the true crime genre. And now about our speakers tonight. Makita Brotman, PhD, is an Oxford-educated scholar and psychoanalyst and the author of several previous books, including An Unexplained Death, The Great Grisby, 
and the Maximum Security Book Club. She is a pro professor of humanities at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. And tonight she will be in conversation with Baynard Woods. Baynard is a writer living in Baltimore. He is the co-author of I Got a Monster, The Rise and Fall of America's Most Corrupt Police Squad, and the author of the forthcoming Inheritance, an autobiography of whiteness. And now, without further ado, I would love to welcome our guests for the evening, Makita Brotman and Baynard Woods for Left Think Books. If everyone would please help me in welcoming them to the screen. Hello. Hi. Hi. Like I said, Makita, I absolutely thought this book was brilliant and I am very thankful that you wrote it. It's definitely not like any other true crime that I have read in a long time. And uh, so thank you for being here this evening. Well, thanks for having me, Shane, and I really appreciate that introduction. And I, I, I am myself interested in true crime, and, I, and I, this book is obviously a true crime book. But I'm also, I'm not really a, a big fan of like genre true crime. I'm really interested in the things that true crime leaves out. Um, and there are some great books, true crime books, that investigate those kind of untold elements of the story. Um, but one of those elements is uh, the what happens to the perpetrator afterwards because true crime often ends with the um the, the court case the conviction the uh, sentencing um and and that is usually the beginning of the story for the perpetrator and we don't really hear anything about what happens afterwards for the perpetrator and in 2013 i i um volunteered i had a sabbatical year and i volunteered in a prison in a, and in this psych hospital in Maryland where I had reading groups and I um, I just became very interested in the lives of the men I met there both in the prison and in the hospital and um, and the part I want to read actually is about how I first met Brian so uh, I'll read that and then I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the story but it's really about um, it starts with the crime which is it's no big giveaway that a couple was found slain. And so um, uh, this uh, in this hospital, which is called Clifton Perkins um, Hospital in Maryland, in Jessup, Maryland, um, I began t running a, a group, which was not a clinical group. It was uh, a vol like I was a volunteer and there were a group of men and women in the group. It was for pretty high functioning patients. and. I should clarify that this is a forensic psychiatric hospital. So these um, the patients had all been sent there by the courts, either after, all of them after committing a crime. Some had were being evaluated to, to see if they were competent to stand trial or not. Others um, had not been found competent to stand trial, like Brian, and had waived their right to stand trial. And then Others had been found not criminally responsible, which is the Maryland's equivalent of um, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity or criminally insane, I guess it, was, it used to be called. So uh, so these were a group of the most high functioning patients and we've been reading stories every week and I got to know some of the patients and they would come and go because they had jobs or they had um, other assignments or they had to you know, go and get the medication. And so it, it tended to be a sort of revolving uh, membership but brian was um, one of the the most consistent participants so i'm going to read the part where is where i first meet him brian was a member of the group from its very first meeting he struck me as smart well-spoken and politely deferential although he was friendly i got the impression that given the choice he'd have preferred to stay in the background in his late 40s at the time he was solidly built with thick brown hair parted down the middle and shaved cleanly above the ears his eyes were bright blue and engaging his gaze level and serious i was drawn to his enthusiasm his intelligence his humor i also admired the way he encouraged the participation of other less confident patients in the group he was especially kind to Tia, a 19 year old hispanic woman who'd been brought to perkins for a competency evaluation and I should just add that the, the patient names are pseudonyms um, just for confidentiality. Tia was a delight. She always did the reading and always had things to say. Chatty and bouncy, she seemed younger than her age. 
partly because she could be so disarmingly open. She talked about struggling with her weight, her looks, the hospital's clothing restrictions. She was particularly indignant when she couldn't have her favorite Ugg boots. I remember her saying, what harm could you do with an Ugg, she kept saying. Despite all constraints, Tia kept up her appearances. She wore her hair in a different style every time we met, explaining the ingenious method she developed of wrapping it in wet paper towels at night to make it curl. On the surface, Tia was optimistic, lively, and gregarious, but this was obviously not the whole picture. Her bubbly disposition was real, but it was also a cover for pain. Tia, like many other patients at Perkins, was being evaluated to see if she was fit to stand trial for a terrible crime. In a fit of postpartum depression, she'd taken the life of her newborn son. Eventually, the strain began to show. One day, she was accompanied to focus on fiction by a nurse whom she introduced as my one-on-one, -on -one, referring to an arrangement in which a patient is monitored every hour of the day. I also heard of two-on-ones and even a three-on-one. In other words, Tia was effectively on suicide watch. Still, her one-on-one -on -one was no hardliner. When class began, Tia's chaperone pulled out a celebrity gossip magazine and a stick of gum, swung back in her seat and made herself at home. In one meeting of the group, after we'd been discussing a short story in the form of a fictional memoir, I asked each of the patients to write a memoir of their own. There was a catch. They only had six words. Tears was poignant and revealing. Dream big. Dancer, actress, cosmetologist, nurse. A few weeks later, she was found competent to stand trial for murder, and she was sentenced to 50 years in prison. One day after Tia had left, I stayed behind at the end of Focus on Fiction and chatted for a while with Brian. At this point, all I knew about him was his name and his ward. We talked about Tia and how much we missed her. She'd brought so much energy to the group. It wasn't the same without her. Brian admitted that he'd had a crush on her. In fact, he said he was going to ask her if she was interested in being his girlfriend until he, he learned she was only 19. Brian was 48 at the time. She was way too young for me, he concluded with regret. She was born in 1994. That's hard to believe. Where were you in 1994, I asked Brian. I was here at Perkins, said Brian, and closer to being released than I am today. What this meant, I realized, was that Brian had been at Perkins for over 20 years. I was surprised because he seemed so stable, sensible, and intelligent. I wondered what he'd done that had caused him to be kept locked up for over two decades, but I was hesitant to ask. Patients rarely discuss their crimes, even with one another. They'd talk about what ward they were on, their security level, the medication they were taking, how long they'd been at Perkins, but I never heard a patient ask another patient about their crime. For most, the subject was too perilous to be broached, except in the vaguest of terms, nor were their offenses ever mentioned in therapy sessions, I gathered, which were focused mostly on current symptoms and medication management. This confused me at first, given that some of the patients at the hospital, even those in my group, had committed high profile crimes that had been covered extensively in the local and even the national media. And watching television seemed to be the patient's main activity. Perhaps the other patients simply hadn't connected the events described in the media to the newcomers on the ward. This wasn't impossible. It was often difficult for me to connect the police mugshots I saw online of mad-eyed, disheveled, dangerous-looking berserkers with the quiet, polite, good-natured patients in my group. At first, when I talked to patients in private before or after Focus on Fiction, I sometimes asked what brought them to the hospital, but I quickly discovered this was not the best way of finding out. They'd answer in shorthand, in a few brief words that encapsulated this story without any particulars. I had a serious drug problem. I had a psychotic break. I was suffering from postpartum syndrome. My father tried to kill me. I went off my meds and got arrested by the cops. These summaries I learned were a way of warding off further questions. Like Tia's optimistic six word memoir, these abridgments were alternate versions of their psychiatric case files in which they were described as dangerously sick all the arguments of prosecutors which depicted them as evil monsters. In the patient's revised narratives, their once promising life was interrupted by the onset of a terrible illness. 
at first I was taken off guard by these censored and self-justifying accounts, but I later came to understand that they were a natural, even a healthy way of looking at things. Don't we all construct a picture of ourselves that, especially of our past behavior that selects, abstracts and distorts in order to minimize our failures and foreground our achievements? And once we've constructed this image, we have a strong interest in defending it, even if other people don't see us in quite so favorable a light. In fact, the further our situation from the social consensus on what constitutes a successful life, the more pressure we may feel to defend our self-image, which makes it all the more unusual that when I asked Brian about his crime, he told the flat, simple truth. I killed my parents, he said. So it's a horrible crime, a terrible crime, but as in, in, in terms of schizophrenics that commit homicide, which is a very, very small percentage, um, killing parents is not uncommon in that small group. And in fact, it used to be known as the schizophrenic crime. Um, and I have a blurb on the back from uh, Robert Rand, who's the author of the Menendez murders, book about the Menendez brothers, another example of a parasite, although in, in their case, um, they were not they were considered sane and they were sent to a prison and they were prosecuted in the in the penal system but that's an example of a high profile parasite and in fact it happens you know around 300 a, a year at least so you know for a for a rare crime um it's not as rare as sometimes one might think and um so what interests me about brian was he just seemed so stable and um intelligent and interesting and we got to know each other i found out more about his backstory and uh, eventually i asked him if he'd be interested in in me writing a book about the case and he was very forthcoming and very interested um he was happy to turn over all his psychiatric records and his court documents and i found that he just had this really interesting life even though it was all he's still there it was all spent behind bars basically you know all kinds of things have happened to him he's got cancer and recovered he's he had a psychiatrist who was insane he's tried to escape he's being shot by police he's defended himself in court numerous times and he seems to be stuck in this like terrible limbo where um the more the more he argues for his sanity the more entrenched he becomes. Anyway, in, in 1997, after he'd been there for um, five years, the hospital um, allowed a film crew in. Um, it was actually an A&E investigative reports documentary, um, one of those hosted by Bill Curtis. And the documentary featured a number of patients and Brian was among them. And in fact, he's featured as like a, a particularly well, you know, high functioning patient patient who's probably going to be released pretty soon, unlike the other patients who are shown who are obviously much, see much sicker. Ironically, Brian's still there when everyone else has been released. So I thought I'd just show you this little clip from the documentary, um, which uh, I've just put together Brian's se segments. It's about three and a half minutes. So it's from, the documentary is called Untying the Straight Jacket, and it's, available, it's easily available on YouTube. Um, so Shane, can you- I thought like, that somehow people would put a device in the attic where they could send subliminal messages to me and that they had some type of control over me. That's when I bought a gun because I thought, well, maybe if I buy a gun, they'll leave me alone. And uh, as soon as I bought a gun, things became just so much worse. I, I just became uh, less and less in touch with reality. I just started becoming a loner around that time. And uh, I became real preoccupied with my dogs because I still trusted my dogs that, that you know, that they uh, loved me and cared about me. And uh, I spent a lot of time with them. Like, you know, when I was off work, I'd go to the park with them, just associated with them as if they were people almost. It just got to the point where one day my parents were yelling at me and uh, I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. And uh, next thing I know, I shot my parents. Brian was suffering from delusions. When he committed his crime, 
he believed that he was in danger and that he had to do what he did in order to prevent something worse from happening. Ten minutes before I killed my parents, I didn't know I was going to kill my parents. I was really scared because I didn't know uh, whether I'd be in prison for the rest of my life or whether I'd be in here because without the medication, I could become dangerous again. I've been put on some tranquilizers and uh, some medications for depression and medications for schizophrenia. and. Uh, you know, I haven't been paranoid since I've been on the medication. I haven't, you know, thought anything that's not real. Patients like Brian may indeed be getting better, but responding to drug treatment marks just the first step down the long road of treatment. Brian Bechtold has never acted out in the five years since he arrived at Perkins after murdering his parents. But because of his extremely violent crime, Doctors are still reluctant to give him new degrees of freedom. We are being very, very careful. We are going to slowly give him more freedom. He might go to an open ward. This is a crowded facility. There are a lot of other patients. People get on each other's nerves. And he's not allowed to lose his temper. For me, what it's like, I'm in court seven days a week and I'm constantly being judged. Uh, everything that goes on here is a judgment. Uh, I want you to just sit relax with your hands on your knees and um, open your mouth. Stick your tongue straight out. Move it to the left and the right. It's very difficult in here. It's very, very strenuous to come across in such a way to present yourself as being sane and to have people question your sanity all the time. So I, I think it's, I mean, that's 22 years ago, that clip, it's still there, obviously. A lot older, he's 50, I think 52, 53 now. Um, and that's, part of what the book's about like I'm, it's so baffling why he's still there especially since there's so little room and such a high threshold for keeping patients there it's it's very difficult for me to understand it and that's what I wanted to try and do in the book and I don't know if I still do understand it but I certainly have a, a better sense of of what it's been like for him over his 27 years there and it, it's so powerful to just see him there talking after reading the book uh you know it it yeah, it, it's really emotional. I encourage people to go back if you put that up somewhere, if that's available, that, that people, uh, because his throughout the course of the book, you see all of the years after that. And, and it is this nightmarishly baffling uh, scenario. And so let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, one of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you about this is the book I had come out last year sort of tried to turn true crime upside down in that it had uh, the cops were the robbers, the defense attorney was investigating these dirty cops and, and trying to get rid of some of the authoritarianism and stuff that true crime will often carry with it. And, and this book seems to do that in a different way of turning it upside down. The, the very beginning is what would be much of many true crime books, this horrible murder. And it seems like you know, you said you're interested in what it doesn't show. And, and to me, part of that is what uh, Rob Nixon, an environmental historian, calls slow violence and environmental stuff. But it seems like the, the excruciating violence that we as a society put him through for his crime, and yet we want to remain unaware of. What, uh, what is it that draws you to that that long as a writer to that longer and slower process than what the uh you know the average true crime writer might focus on i think that's a really good question i think it's because um you know just as in perkins there's you're either a doctor or a patient and there's nothing in between and that's part of the problem for brian is that 
like you know there's this there's this binary and it's almost as though we can't let that slip because if we do we have to confront the fact that you know it could go either way you know we're, we're all parts of both and there's all these gray areas in between and i think um i think it's the same with with true crime you know there's the victim and the perpetrator or the cops and the robbers and and those roles are fixed and and determinate but if you take a longer view i think you can see that um perpetrator and victim are simply different points on the same person's lifetime so it just depends like at what point you're telling the story you know you, you tell the story of a perpetrator at a different point then that perpetrator is the victim so i think the advantage of taking that long view is to that we see like these positions only seem fixed because we happen to be looking at this particular point in the story but look at another point in the story and those roles are completely reversed or completely different and taking a a long view like that just a it's much easier i think for for me at least to like to see how those how artificial those binaries are and how easily they break down but also how much we need them because it's really like everything is inchoate without them you know it's really hard to empathize and to know what to do with your sympathies um i mean i i found that reading i got a monster that it was like just the the, the psychological complexity of those roles once it's all mixed up um it's really it's really hard to know where to direct with your sympathies and um and then you you know you start to question like the justice system and conventions of fiction and all kinds of all kinds of things so um yeah i mean, yeah, I mean so, so much, much of crime writing whether writing fiction or newspaper or uh you know what we call true crime is about ultimately the restoration of some order that uh, there's this horrible breach in order and then it comes back and uh you know, it's solved in some way or another from Anipus on. Uh, but this has really the opposite effect of that as well. The, the um, heartbreaking thing is how little changes for Brian or how it gets worse than, than what you just read, how when you first start talking to him that he, he was closer to getting out then than he is now. Uh, where do you end up feeling i mean you you still work in these institutions or or this is your your second book going in to teach literature in in an institution uh what do you think about the the re order at all in our our world after a picture like this it's like we create so much fear with true crime and i leave this being terrified of uh the psychiatric system rather than of of this killer how uh how did it feel going into that environment every every day as you were talking to him and and um continuing to live in the world well i think i think yeah i i think you're you're right about that that idea of the restoration of order and how and how much we how much we need it and how we fantasize about it and or just in terms of like conclusions and closure and whereas in fact actually um what happens at the i mean there isn't really an end it's like just this mess this inchoate mess it's a mess on one hand but it's also not a dramatic interesting mess all the time it's like a kind of everyday you know bureaucratic you know not even interesting enough to be called kafka-esque sort of nightmarish daily reality um but i think i forgot your question. what was your question <laughs> sorry uh, yeah i mean it was really just about the way that like i mean what to me what your book did was greatly disturb our sense of order our narratives about sanity and insanity about what violence is about what crime is and what punishment is um, how did how did d diving deeply into this change you is i guess what i'm really asking yeah i mean i don't think i don't think it 
it did change me. But I think, you know, the same way that we want closure in narrative terms, I think we also tend to believe in, like, either justice in the courts or a cure in in the hospital or in medicine. Like, there's some end product which we're moving towards, which you know, which is it, we're eventually going to arrive at. And to find out that like that's not the case, that you can actually make progress, make progress, make progress, and then, you know, go right back to the beginning. And um, and in fact, that there is no path, you know, there is no like track that you're going down, or at least there doesn't seem to be. It's, um, I think it was, I, I think I, like everyone else, I kind of fall into the trap of wanting things to to work out and to be and to be more stable and and progressive and successful than they are um but as for like on an everyday level i think for brian just to the same the same as for the men in the in the prison like once you've been somewhere i mean one of them told me this once you've been somewhere for like you know more than 10 years that becomes your reality that becomes your daily reality and you lose memory of what what came before and so it's not like as traumatic as it might be you know for you or i it's it's ordinary life you know you you lose you lose sight of those privileges that you used to have and you stop stop missing them to a degree um some of the men in the prison talked about developing what they call jail brain which i think um, brian has evidence of too which is like having a really really good memory because there's so little like in your life on a daily basis you're you know there's so little stimulation that you rely on your memory so like the past becomes really really vivid and brian can remember dates and details from the past in you know in really exquisite detail um but yeah it's because because there's and, and so the later you go to prison, the easier time you have of it because you've got like more of a storehouse of those memories to, to rely on and to look back on to um, to kind of stimulate your everyday life. But I think it's difficult to, to know. I mean, it, it's probably like looking back on your childhood. I mean, it's really hard to, to remember what it was like on a kind of daily basis, you know, waking up as a child. Um, it's, it's like that long ago. So and because it's such a gradual change it's like you know walking down stairs you get used to one stair and then you go into the next stair um so i think it's it's maybe not as disturbing as it seems to to your eye i mean one of the the horrible and and but fascinating things about this world that he's in of clifton perkins is the way that language is is sort of degraded and stolen from him. Everything that he says means something different uh, than than what he's saying. And and he has to sort of he tries to then not speak, and that's interpreted, or, or you know, be more closed in. That's interpreted against him. And it's always based on the hypothesis that we already know, and so everything falls into that. And he's accused of being paranoid because he's being observed and stuff like this all of the time. Um, what were the conversations between y'all? So then you become another observer that in one way is restoring maybe language to him or, or letting him, uh, but what, can you say a little bit more about the negotiations y'all had about, and, and like what he, has he read it and what is, what's happening now uh, with him now that the book's out? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Like that, that clip I just showed you, um, I, I asked him about, you know, do you remember that T-shirt you're wearing? And he, he said, I haven't seen it. He's never seen that show. Um, so in 2016, when my book about the prison came out, they banned me from going to the prison and then they banned me from going to Perkins too. <laughs> so um, until then, like when I started the group, I was kind of seen, even though it was a voluntary group and I wasn't taking any notes in their files, the patients never seemed to believe that and they they were very guarded and suspicious and were very wary of um, being open with me and 
even you know it was impossible for me to convince them that this you know I wasn't reporting back to a doctor or this wasn't being held against them and um, and so I, I think after I was banned after that I was allowed to go in as a visitor and talk to Brian on the phone um, and so I think it became like we became much more like confederates then and he trusted me more because I was also uh, on the outs and um, and I, I experienced it f firsthand, you know, that I was never told what I'd done wrong or, um, and in fact, now Brian is eligible for this thing called a level three pass, which means that he can leave the hospital for a, a few hours in the company of a friend or family member. Well, his sister's in Ohio, she can't help him. The only other person he knows is me, but they've told him neither Makita nor anyone she knows can, can accompany you without giving him or me a reason. So um, so I understand this paranoia about, about language and rules and hostility and um, uh, inexplicable um, rules that don't seem to have any <laughs> meaning behind them. Um, but, you know, I think that the language issue is really interesting because Brian would kind of, it, it's a question of like almost learning code words that a certain doctor or even a certain CEO, like a certain regime in the hospital, um, as time passes, one will supplant another. So for a while it was about, it was all about um, support was the, the key word. And then it, then it became compliance and and no one really is ever sure what this these things mean and there could be kind of anything or everything um you know escape the word escape is not used it's elope and um being unsafe or feeling unsafe is code for suicidal and um and it's and brian has been i mean patients can get access to their files but most of the notes are written for other psychiatrists and not for the patients themselves so it's really difficult to decipher what the psychiatrist is actually saying and whether what it means about the patient's behavior and how they should act in the future and um one of the big difficulties brian's had is that like his main support is his religion and yet that's religious religiosity is seen as a symptomatic of schizophrenia or psychosis so that was something he learned to keep quiet about um, which is really sad but then keeping quiet about it meant that he was concealing things and he wasn't revealing things to the psychiatrist and uh, so it, you know it's really this kind of catch-22 um, since I've not been allowed to, to go in so I can go and visit um, and take him supplies and things and then after COVID, the visiting was canceled, but they introduced online, like Skype visiting. So that was really, that's been really interesting. Cause I mean, it's, you know, Brian's never used Skype before. Um, so like I can show him my dog and you know, that's pretty nice for him. In some ways it's make, it's, it's more convenient. Um, visits are more convenient and um, I can't, uh, you know, I don't have to drive all the way up there and so on. So in some ways it's, it's, it's not an improvement for, you know, for people who want to touch each other and hug and kiss and, and families and those kind of things, but which you can do to a degree at Perkins, which is an improvement on the prison. But, um, you know, for us, it's a, it's, it's kind of an improvement. Um, so I, I think he, he sees me as a friend and we, I'm, we have interesting conversations and he, he really, um, you know, I'm always impressed by his, his memory and his insight. And there are things that we disagree about and things that we don't talk about. I showed him earlier drafts of the book and uh, he liked the earlier drafts much more than he likes the finished draft. And um, mainly because I had to in include the crime, stop with the crime and include more details about the crime which, and he really wanted it for more about the hospital and his struggle in the hospital. And it's, it's difficult for him to revisit the crime. And, um, 
but I, I explained why, and he understood why I have to include that, and that's such an important part of the book. Um, so, at, at some point, he said, "You know, I, I wonder, is this going to harm you in any way?" The whole world? And he said, "He, he, he says there's nothing that there's nothing more they can do to me." Um, and he kind of gave me carte blanche to to write what I wanted. So, I'm hoping that it won't be used against him. Yeah, I mean, that's that's fascinating that, um, I mean, I had wondered how they possibly let you in after uh, Maximum Security Book Club, and, and I didn't know that uh, that you had had, uh, it was before that came out when you were, were able to teach the class. Um, you know, and, and I, I should say, I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, you should read Maximum Security Book Club, it's great. and. I ended up inadvertently a character in it as I went in from the Baltimore City paper to write a story about Makita's work there. And I said something that got them in trouble, got the book group in trouble in my story. And then that became part of the, the book and part of the process of it. And, and it really made me think a lot more about how on the outside, we don't know how what we do about what's happening inside refracts uh, through these these rules that we don't understand and that seem arbitrary to us but also that he he liked the earlier versions better i feel like is um one of the really strong things is that he's not an innocent part there, there's no uh, as as in that clip shows there we look often in various kinds of criminal justice writing for the innocent victim of the system but this is more about We've almost given up on prison being actually corrective or rehabilitative, and so this is we still sort of have maybe uh, more faith in these hospitals that people get well and get out, and the uh, the coming together of the justice system and that in his case just ends up as this infuriating. Uh, you know, when he's in court, I, I've seen a lot of trials and stuff, and I've almost never uh, felt as like someone's in a more impossible position than um, when his his own effectiveness as, I mean, as an attorney is proof against him. And, and the thing that everyone should, seems to me, should be so aware of is that they say that, um, you know, oh, well, the average person can't recognize this sickness. So like what, it's not your words or your behavior, but the content of your thought. Um, yeah. You, you point out at the end a little bit of that there's been some improvement in uh, the way that things are working at Perkins. Um, is are are those still generally the same criteria with which people are being judged there though? That the ones that he that we see him being judged by in the court in the book. And yeah, I, I think so. And I, I, but I have tried to like other patients are not kept as long as Brian. Very few. Pa he's been there longer than most of the doctors and many of the other patients i've tried to understand why and it, it it is a terrible crime that he committed but like i say many of the patients there have committed similar crimes and at the first few years as that clip showed he was really like playing by the rules and he was taking the medication even though he didn't want to and he was um repeating the mantras and doing everything you know going through the hoops and doing everything he could but when he was forced to take medication that was actually the, was actually making him impotent and incontinent, he he reached a stage where he just couldn't take it anymore, and he um, kicked back. You know, he he acted out, and he was. And it's I think it's pretty rare that patients actually do that and actually you know to take a hostage and escape from the hospital and get shot by the police. I mean. Patients escape, but usually not so dramatically. And um, and so I think like that. Ever since then, things have been. It's been much, much more difficult for him to get any traction because that's been held against him. Um, and then later on, you know, 15 years after that, he a a had another acting out after he was returned from court and attacked a social worker and um, and various other times he's been. You know, he's been through periods of being very hostile and aggressive although not as much as some of the other patients and certainly 
I don't see that as pathological or symptomatic. I mean, I see that as what any human being would do under those circumstances. It doesn't seem irrational or a sign of any kind of mental illness. It seems like a, a normal human reaction to to that kind of indignity. But I think the the part that you're talking about, Bernard, is is really the part that kind of that angers and annoys me the most is that in the when Brian is defending himself in court, in this case, it's for he uh, he he had cancer and he wanted not to be cured. You know, he wanted not the he said he had the right not to take his cancer medication because he wanted to die, and the hospital applied for guardianship and took him to court to get guardianship over him to force him to you know to, to go to chemotherapy and so on and part of the judicial system in the point of the jury trial is for the people to to look at the information and judge for themselves and the same with the judge and and the reason why brian acted as his own attorney which is normally completely inadvisable is that he wanted to show the jury that he was you know he wanted them to see him he is what's on trial here. They want, he wanted to show them that he was, he knew what was going on. He was able to understand his disease. He was able to marshal a, an argument. He was able to fight back against the psychiatrist. He, he understood their reasoning and found flaws in it. And he did a really, really good job. The problem is that the members of the jury, although it was a hung jury, he did really well. And it's the judges really that, that the problem is that uh, will all the judiciary will always turn to the psychiatrist and say, "Well, you know, he certainly looks sane. He speaks rationally. He seems like a perfectly high-functioning individual." But what do I know? You know, I'm not a psychiatrist. These psychiatrists say he he's dangerous, or there are these um, these things going on under the surface in his head that are dangerous. Then, you know, they're the experts, and I think. First of all, there's there's real kind of mysticism about psychiatry and what the psychiatrists know and are, are capable of knowing. And secondly, it's it's cowardice and it's like avoiding liability. I think the judges think, well, if if he we did release him and he killed someone, then it would be on me. And instead of just treating Brian like an ordinary individual who has agency and makes these decisions of his own free will and the same kind of thinking that any of us would would go into go into making a decision. Everything's seen as kind of symptomatic. And a couple of the patients that told me that they they'd been in prison and they would rather be in prison. In fact, they'll do things to try and get sent to prison, because in prison, like number one, you have a determinate sentence. Even if it's a life sentence, it's better than this this kind of unending horror of hope and the possibility of hope. You know, in prison, you know it's 50 years or it's not 50 years. You have parole, you don't have parole. And Brian would be much better off in front of a parole board. But also in prison, um, there's that you may be more restricted, but there's a that you have a certain dignity in, in your choices. If you choose not to go to breakfast, you don't want to go in the yard, that's your choice. It's not noted in your file and seen as you know, more evidence of your psychosis. Um, you're seen as a a person like other people who's simply making rational decisions. Um, so that's a that's a very telling indictment. I think the fact that people have actually you know been in the prison system and want to stay in the pr prison system rather than going back to Perkins. Yeah, it. it I mean, you you show that so well in such uh, horrific and and just uh, but beautifully rendered detail. I mean, we should just. Uh, before going to the audience questions, just mention that, that like what a, uh, you know, it turns this, like you were talking about this very mundane daily life in the hospital into a really, really gripping narrative. And so uh, you did, you did a great job with that. Thanks. Thank you. That was, that was, it was really hard to, to make something so tedious but into something interesting. So I'm glad that you think that. Uh, thank you both for this incredible conversation. Um, this like reminds me of a lot of um, kind of books and things that have kind of revolutionized the police industry, the medical industry. And I think that this book should and could 
um, hopefully revolutionize some of the psychiatric psychiatric industry. And it proves that there is a lot of need for reform, both like, I mean, we're talking a lot about police reform, but this should be included in the conversation because it is an endless cycle for prisoners or for patients. So um, let's start with a question from Aaron while other people, um, if you, the people watching, if you have questions, be sure to type those up in the comments section, either on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, but let's start with a question from Aaron. So does Brian consider himself a victim of the system, society, or life in general? Or, or does he even consider himself a victim? I don't think he considers himself a victim. I think, um, I think he's, he keep, I think what makes his case so difficult and so unique is that he's maintained his dignity. I think if it would be, he'd have had an easier time of it if he had thought of himself more as a victim and had um, been able to go along with, you know, what things he's supposed to say and the way he's supposed to behave. Um, but he, he can't do that and he does maintain a certain amount of dignity. So he doesn't see himself as a victim of life and he he told me that you know his whole family was mentally ill and in the when i talk about his family i i, I really see it as brian kind of acting out the un, unspoken desires of his, the siblings and um and so i think in some ways it's like his parents created this uh this implement to bring about their own downfall kind of um so he he he, he realizes there's mental illness in his family. He certainly admits very clearly that he was mentally ill and he was mentally ill for a, a, a long time and his drug use helped cause that, you know, or certainly encouraged it. He did a lot of PCP and smoked pot when he was younger. And, um, but he also believes that he's, he's not mentally ill and hasn't been for a long time. However, he, and he, he doesn't, he stopped saying this, but he believes that he was possessed by the devil and that he had a revelation to turn himself in. And he, he's not sure what it was, but it was a religious transformation. And since then he's been sane. And, um, and so he doesn't really see himself as a victim of the system or the state. Um, he sees himself as someone who's kind of like a, you know, a figure in Dante's purgatory. It's like trapped in this, in this limbo that can't get out, um, but but is is not willing to, to give up and stop trying. Um, forgive me for not. I feel like I should know the answer, but I don't. Um, with schizophrenia, or uh, what is it being called now? Or um, you, you mentioned in the book that it's being called something else now, correct? Well. Paranoid schizophrenia doesn't usually exist, but it's like schizotypal personality disorder. Um, is that a is that something that people can cure, like be cured of, or is that something that needs to be treated with medication for the duration of their life? In the past, it was seen as you know it was really like a cancer diagnosis. This was this was it. You know your life your lifespan was going to be limited, and you're going to get worse and worse. But now, I mean, there's there's um, there's controversy about the diagnosis. Some people think it's it's just like this catch-all for all kinds of psychotic illnesses that that uh, that people don't really understand. Um, but the the doctors in Perkins see, tell Brian it's like it's like having diabetes that you have to take medication the rest of your life. You'll learn to manage it. You'll know what your symptoms are and so on. But they'll never say it's cured. It's always in remission or you know so his at one point his diagnosis was paranoid schizophrenia single episode in remission um but now it's back to you know schizotypal personality again i mean his diagnosis changes and changes so i mean people with schizophrenia don't usually um 
it doesn't usually go away completely, but it's usually manageable with medication. But in some cases, it's a single episode that never occurs again. Yeah. You talk about that in the book where if if a murder occurs from someone who has uh, that personality disorder, that it's A, incredibly rare, and B, a single in- instance typically. So I was going to ask you about the recidivism, um, which do you know the rates of recidivism for, like, if he were to get out, what the chances would be? Oh, yeah, I mean, um, there's, I mean, I... I, I quote in the book that it's like a third, a third of the of people who've committed a, a homicide and with paranoid schizophrenia, a third will um, have difficulty. Will always have to be on medication um, and may be dangerous, but probably more likely to themselves than to anyone else, and may commit suicide. A third may um, may always have to be in the hospital, never recover, and a third will never have any um, um, symptoms again. Yeah. It's it's just fascinating, like the amount of medical history that you put in here and the, um, like, it it was kind of uh, like a lot of things that I had known from other sources, but having it all together really helped kind of solidify some thoughts and feelings that I'd had. I, I, what surprised me was like how, how, what bad writers the doctors are. Not just handwriting, but like <laughs> illiterate, really. And I mean, that one of the things that shocked me most was when you write about the psychiatrist uh, turned stalker, and how responsible he was for some of the patients. Com- like he was basically keeping them there when he himself was committing the same crimes. Yeah. And, you know, the Brian says if they, if the psychiatrist can't recognize that their colleague that, who they're working with every day is dangerously mentally ill, how, how do they make decisions about the patient? Yeah. So I want to get back to, like, because this book is it's categorized as true crime and it's called true crime. But the true crime aspect of it is, is like just the very beginning of the book. So I want to emphasize to readers that, yes, there is like a huge part of the story that is true crime and is based on this instance and the circumstances beyond it. But it's also an incredible look at the psychiatric industry and how they need to reform. And I'm wondering if you want to leave us with a note of like what you think might be the most important steps to get that reform started. I think it, you know, when I, when I started writing the book, I'm, I'm really kind of telling Brian's story and I'm not, I'm not really interested in or in a position to advocate for, I think it's such a huge question really. Um, I think one kind of indicative factor is that Brian has got, you know, he has found a, a psychiatrist who deals in, who specializes in competency issues, a, a psychiatrist for the defense who's, who's met with him many times and who will testify in his behalf on co- in court and say that he's sane, but he wants $7,000, which is not an unusual fee for a psychiatrist to work for the defense, but you know, it's more than Brian will make in, in a year. So I think that's a, a kind of indication that money is at the heart of most most of this, whether it's insurance payments or, you know, there's just so much um, or between the drug companies, the insurance payments, that there's so much that's entrenched in money that it's, um, it's if Brian were wealthy, he would have been out a long time ago. So, um, I, you know, I just, I think telling one person's story is, that's all I really want to do, just make people read the story and take, take Brian's case seriously and realize that there are, um, that, there, that, that, that the perpetrator has a history too, and most perpetrators were victims. 
All right. Well, I want to thank you both for this incredible conversation. Baynard, thank you so much for asking really incredible questions. Uh, reminder that Baynard's book is available now in hardcover and is coming out in paperback in September, so you can pre-order that, which I should. I will include a link for the pre-order of the paperback. I included the hardcover, which is available now, but I'm going to share the paperback right now. There we go. And that Makita's book, Couple Found Slain, is now available at Left Bank Books. It is um, just an incredible read. It is fantastic and something that is very unique. And uh, Jessica said, looking forward to reading. And I think that I'm hoping that everyone watching is also either looking forward to reading it or has already read it because it has been out for two days. So you could have read it by now. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Shane. Thank you. And to everyone watching at home, thank you for joining us. And I hope you have a good night. Bye. Thanks, Chuck. All right. Bye.